welcome back to this Talking Europe agricultural special. Well, we've now hopped to Spain, more specifically to the Canaries, an autonomous region of seven islands and another of the EU's outermost regions. Agriculture here is not a huge part of the economy, despite getting substantial subsidies from the EU. What agriculture there is tends to be specialised in tropical fruits and vegetables. In fact, every year 420,000 tonnes of bananas are produced in the Canaries, the fruit of many a conflict. Completely bananas. Did you know that the longest modern-day political, economic and commercial conflict is bananas? as in literally about bananas. The conflict is over 20 years old. Why? Because the banana is the world's most popular fruit. 130 million tonnes of bananas are grown every year. Global production has tripled in the last four decades. Bananas are also the most well-travelled fruit, with an export market worth 7 billion euros. 30% of export bananas head for Europe. The European market accounts for some 2 billion euros, a sizeable slice of the world's banana bread. A bread that is made up of three categories of bananas. The dollar banana, supported by four industrial giants in the United States. They're produced in Latin America. It's top of the crop, accounting for 70% of bananas eaten in the EU. They're cheaper than their counterparts, but the EU does slap heavy import taxes on them. Then there's the ACP banana, the Africa, Caribbean and Pacific. They make up one-fifth of bananas eaten in the EU. Produced in former European colonies, they're given somewhat privileged access to the European market. And the smallest of the bunch, the EU banana. 10% of bananas eaten in Europe are grown there, and they're heavily subsidised. In 1993, the US and Latin America lodged a series of complaints to the World Trade Organization, complaining about the level of European customs taxes, 176 euros a tonne. Europe eventually had to concede defeat. An agreement was found in 2009. From January 2017, taxes on bananas will drop some 30%. Critics fear the dollar banana will eat up the entire market. But the ACP and EU bananas won't go down without a fight. saw there that the EU banana is by far the smallest of the bunch and yet one of the most highly subsidised. To tell us a bit more, we're joined now by an MEP from Gran Canaria, Mr Juan Fernandez López Aguilar. Like, how important is the banana sector for the Canaries? <laughs> it's important in every possible way. But the banana has always been there for more than one century. It's been the major one product of the Canary, not the only one, not the only one. We also have tomatoes, we also have flowers, but we got mostly bananas. Heavily protected, as you have said, heavily subsidized, as you have said, as a consequence of the uh, activism and the internal drive of a strong lobby. But when you look, I believe something like over 140 million euros a year is given to the exactly. Spanish bananas. Why this insistence on the bananas when you, when you admit that there's other products, products around? Because the banana has, uh, first of all, uh, an environmental dimension. The Canarian landscape is very much linked to this. Take a look. This is how the Canarias looked like for centuries. And uh, still, there are some places which look like this, despite the incredible uh, uh, territorial uh, <laughs> revolution that has uh, been brought about by massive tourism, which has destroyed so many uh, traditional landscapes devoted to agriculture, in particular to banana, but has also a working force labor dimension. There are at least 7,000 workers directly on the banana plantation and at least 25,000 with the families and the related jobs involved, which heavily depend on the banana producing. And there is also, you may put it as an environmental, which means to try to protect a landscape as it has been inherited from our ancestors. OK, well, we're going to uh, see if, if the extra funds and the extra resources uh, for the banana are worth it. Our reporter Johan Vaudin went to, to check out exactly how the banana here is produced and indeed protected. In the open air or inside greenhouses, banana plantations are integral to the Canary Islands landscape. They account for 9,000 hectares of the archipelago. That's nearly 20% of its total landmass. 
In Spain, in Spain there's a difference between bananas from the Canaries and bananas from elsewhere because they have certain characteristics. They're sweeter, and because this is a subtropical area, they mature more slowly on the plantations. Esther Dominguez represents the influential association of Canary banana producer organizations. She says the sweet, high-quality fruit produced in the Canaries deserves and needs its annual EU subsidy. European bananas cost four times more to produce than their South American rivals. The labor cost is higher because the work involves more skill, and here we abide by European legislation so we have fees to pay, like social security. Also, our plantations are small scale, less than a hectare on average, so we can't use heavy machinery. Our bananas are sold at 60 cents more per kilo than bananas grown in other countries. 400,000 tonnes of bananas are grown each year in the Canaries, Europe's number one producer. Once harvested, the fruit heads to one of 90 processing centres. How much does a bunch like that weigh? 60, 70 kilos. And you bring it all the way here from the fields on your back. Men work in cutting and transport, sorting and washing is done by women. The association's goal is to protect these jobs. The industry generates 1,200 jobs directly and indirectly, and there are 8,200 agricultural workers who live off bananas. Unemployment is high, so the banana industry is very important. Almost all these bananas will be eaten in Spain. The Canary Islands' small-scale producers dream of conquering other European markets, but they have a rival, bananas from the French West Indies. Well, one thing we didn't really see there in that report was something a lot of ecologists point out, and that is, while it may look beautiful to look out on these banana plantations, to grow a banana takes a lot of water. I pay respect to the ecologist's point of view, but the watering system for the banana production in the Canary Islands was arranged a long time ago, successfully so. The Canary Islands are not all alike. They are drier islands, as is the case of Fuerteventura and Lanzarote, and they are greener islands. For the second thing, it used to rain more when it, this whole thing got started in the late 19th century. The tomato, it's not as protected as the banana in the Canary Islands and a lot of uh, people here complain about a deal that was done between the EU and Morocco saying that it's going to lead to too much competition and really uh, kill the tomato production in the Canaries. Every time the European Union exerts its union trade policy, there is an impact on vulnerable regions. It's the case of Morocco. Of course, the tomato producers in the Canaries did complain a lot, and they do complain a lot, because, of course, the allegations that the Moroccan tomato does not enjoy equal footing on labor, health, on sanitation, and all that. And they are, they are right. They have a point. They really have a point. They need protection. I cannot ignore that Morocco happens to be a strategic neighbor. If we want them to help when it comes to fishery, when it comes to uh, protecting our external borders, we should try to come to terms when it comes to their agriculture too. Now we mentioned earlier uh, tourism, it's such a, a vital sector for the Canaries, uh, really more profitable than farming. Uh, are there protections in place? Yes, tourism has grown massively and I have seen it throughout my life where there was virgin paradise, now there is massive <laughs> constructions and uh, hotel and tourism facilities. But we also have to take care of protecting land and protecting our environment. And I have to say that the Canary Islands, in comparative terms with the rest of the regions of the so-called autonomic federal arrangement of Spain, is the region in which the share of its territory, which is legally protected, is the highest, the highest. Now, we looked at uh, tomatoes, we've looked at bananas, but there's also, you know, in the past, there were other produce that were really quite widespread in the Canaries. One of them, a, a little beetle called the cochineal. Once upon a time, over the 17th and 18th century, the Canarian economy was heavily dependent, dependent on the so-called cochineal beetle, which was used to dye clothing. And we exported that dyeing for the clothings everywhere in the world. There's still remaining some, some, some survival of that cochinilla beetle uh, producing, which uh, in a way is a signal 
of the importance that it took in our history. Well, indeed, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Lopez Aguilar. Indeed, our reporter went to find out and take a very close look at the production of a cochineal beetle dye that does still persist here on the Canary Islands. This is the Perez family's treasure trove. Inside, resting on cactus leaves, tens of thousands of female cochineal insects cover their eggs. When the weather is just right, father and son disperse the insects on their 22 hectare prickly pear plantation. We fill a sock with the female, a live insect, and then we hang it on different leaves. The goal is that in three months, all the cacti are infested with the cochineals. The technique has been passed from generation to generation on the Canary Islands. Imported from Mexico, the scale insect acclimatized to the archipelago. But the invention of synthetic dye has threatened the tradition. By shaking like this, we kill the insects. The cochineals are left to dry for two weeks. Then their tiny bodies reveal the treasure, carmine. This is carmine. Carmine is a strong natural dye used in the textile, food and beauty industries. It's found in strawberry and raspberry yogurts. It makes up the E120 chemical. And you can also find it in lipsticks and in meat. Two tons of dried insects a year sold for 60 euros the kilo and exported to mainland Europe. The product, made in the Canaries, has the EU's controlled designation of origin status, and the Perez family are hoping for subsidies. We need a minimum of 14 million euros so that we can open our own factory for extracting carmine here in the Canaries. Investment that would create 500 new jobs, say the Perez family, and expand the size of their plantation by 10. The Lomo Espino Farm, 50,000 metres squared of biodynamic agriculture. We're joined by Gerson de Crotois de Vissos. You're um, a biologist with an international career in marine biology and ecology. Uh, firstly, just tell us, you like to do your shopping at this farm, but it's not really the most common type of farm here in the Canaries, is it? No, it's true. I mean, there's not many of them around. It's really nice and the environment is really nice also and they have a great diversity of products. Let's find out a tiny bit more from its owner, Rosie. As far as we're concerned, it's vital to have as much diversity as possible. We currently have 30 different types of vegetables and we're adding various fruit trees. I think that overall the position of organic farming is growing in strength. It's starting to gain recognition. But at the same time, conventional agriculture still gets more grants and aid compared to organic, ecological, biodynamic methods. OK, well, we heard there from Rosie, she thinks this uh, mentality around organic farming is growing in strength here in the Canaries. And do you agree? It's true that until, you know, in the last decades, uh, agriculture and, and other productions were more monospecific and were more less integrated in the environment. But now we realize that it's more and more important to make sure that your activity is integrated in the environment. And therefore, it's a kind of agriculture that is um, developing. Do you think also we maybe need to start looking at that in terms of uh, farming on the land compared to farming on the, on the sea, in the sea? Do we need to mix those two worlds? Because for now, they're quite divided still. Yeah, and, and actually these two worlds have a lot in common in the, in the marine environment also. It's true that it's still um, developing in a kind of monospecific uh, way, but uh, we're trying to build some models that would enable uh, development and integrate it in and multiple development. Well, I know you're working on one project that could, in fact, see us growing new species, uh, plants, even animals, in uh, the water. Let's take a closer look at your latest research. So here you're entering the uh, Ecoacua Institute facilities uh, from the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. And what we're seeing here are different uh, fish production tanks. Inside these tanks, we are testing different things. One of them is feeding 
these different species some feeds that are sustainable. That means that we are looking at integrating vegetable sources of protein that are coming from marine origins or from a terrestrial origin. We are also working on developing a sustainable production technique. We are entering the room where you can see that there is some freshwater fish that are then linked to uh, freshwater vegetables and the water is circulated inside the system to be reused. The ultimate goal is um, well, to diversify the kind of species that can be produced in aquaculture. Of course, to develop sustainable production, that's one of the most important things, to uh, have the link with the environment. think of farming and fishing you think of fish farms uh, which is a, a great success really here in the Canaries something that really took off however some people fear that you know if fish from fish farms get out into the seas that could be dangerous how do you see it are they a good thing well it, it depends from which point of view you look at it but actually if you focus on um, species that belong to the original environment and you, if you're producing them then it's not a, it's not a problem uh, in, it, in itself because, because the species are or originally from the place they are being produced. Okay, so it's only when you mess with nature, maybe and introduce something unnatural. That yeah, it can be yeah. A like the same link like it happened on, on you know, at the terrestrial level. Gerson, thanks so much for your time. And thanks also, of course, to you at home for having joined us. So that brings us to the end of this edition. But we'll be back in the new year where we'll be once again following that budget from the Common Agricultural Policy to see how it is and could be used. See you then.